Um, I'm a principal practitioner with the Lucy Faithful Foundation and um, I have responsibility for overseeing our work with young people who display harmful sexual behaviour. Um, I'm a manager, I supervise staff, but I'm a clin clinician at heart and I still um, work with, with young people and I found that there is nothing like um, sitting in front of a teenager to get direct feedback about whether what you're saying and what you're doing is, is, is any help to them. So um, I'm going to be talking about practice. Um, I'm going to flick over some of my, my slides um, because Arnon's covered some of the stuff that I was going to talk about um, but what I want to, want to do is introduce to you a family um, that we've been using with um, Hope for Children and Families and Resources in terms of training practitioners um, in using and getting familiar with using the um, resources that we've developed. Um, but today, what I want to talk about and focus on is, is Charlie. Um, Jack, Leslie, David and Susan, they all have a different story. Um, and this is a family based on a balance between um, strengths and, and areas of concern. But for this afternoon, I think it's important to talk about Charlie. Um, um, if you look at Charlie's story, um, he's received a, a, a two-year custodial sentence for attempted rape of his eight-year-old sister, Susan. Um, now, Lucy Faithful Foundation provides a specialist service for young people, um, assessment and interventions for adolescents in secure settings. And what I want to do is, is talk about how we work with Charlie. Um, this, this presentation, you, you'll see that I've used pictures, and I think that's important as a reminder. We all know that um, when we're working with young people and children, we need to use materials. Um, we need to, to use a language that, that, that they can respond to and they can relate to. So this is hopefully giving you an idea of what intervention is like from Charlie's perspective. Understanding and making sense of what's happened us professionals might call it assessment, analysis and formulation. But for Charlie and for Charlie's family, they just want to make sense and understand what's happened. And, and this is the sort of thing that we might do to try and help, help that process. So what we want to do is understand all the things in Charlie's world. Um, we want to try and understand his story and help him tell his story. We use, we use good lives model in order to do that, um, but what's the good lives model got to do with me? And, and that's what, what Charlie asks. Um, and what we would do is, is, is teach the model and, and explain to Charlie um, about um, understanding needs, um, understanding strengths. And also we find that when we talk to parents and, and, and teach the model to parents, it, it really helps them get a grasp of... Um, why this behaviour might have happened, why, why have we got to this stage. So that's a little bit about assessment. Um, my work are really important, um, and, and we know from desistance studies, the thing that young people and children remember most is the qualities of their worker. They're not really going to remember much about the content of what you talked about, what questionnaire you filled out. Um, they understand, they remember the qualities of the worker. So the importance of being listened to, they didn't judge me, they were honest with me, I felt cared for, um, I had a laugh. Now, sometimes this is a little bit uh, controversial and we say, well, should we put this one in or not? But actually, what we know is children and, and young people, they learn through fun and play. And so when we want, we want um, a young person to recall and remember things and changes, actually, they, they, it needs to be fun, um, as well as the practitioner having fun, of course. Um, but we also... Um, need to stick to what we agree, so we need to be consistent. Um, we don't all drive green cars either. Um, now, Charlie's formulation. Um, important that we don't just come up with, when we finish our assessment, we don't just come up with um, a list of risk factors or factors of, of, of balance between strengths and, and concerns. What we do is put that into the context of this young person's experience, um, their environment, and what's happened. Um, an example of Charlie's formulation might look a little bit like this. We're doing it in a language that actually it's quite, it's quite humbling if you sit down and, and write a formulation with a young person. It really, really does need to make sense to them. So mum and dad are arguing a lot and sometimes hitting each other. They were not always able to look after us properly or notice when I was angry and unhappy. Mum was always crying. Mum left me to look after my younger brother and sister. I started to stay at home a lot and not spend time with my friends. I stopped liking school because I got behind in the work and the teachers didn't understand. Dad never spent any time with me. 
Looking at pornography made me feel better and seemed fun. I started cuddling my sister in bed when she cried. I liked how it felt. I started doing sexual things. I knew it was wrong and I felt bad afterwards. So we want to, we want to make sense of, of the story with Charlie um, and we want to pull those factors together and formulate. So let's have a look at what Charlie's plan might look like. What might the intervention look like? Um, generally, with young people, when we're talking about goods and needs, these are the sorts of things that we, we, we know that they're looking for when they're, committing their, when, when they're getting their needs met through kind of risky behaviours. They want to learn to... They're having difficulty learning, uh, dealing with difficult feelings, um, having people in my life, having fun and achieving, being my own person, meeting my sexual needs being healthy, staying safe and being responsible. These are the things that young people haven't got um, or are, are lacking in some of the, the internal capacity and skills and we want to try and build those with Charlie. Um, but at the same time, um, we also want to kind of increase his opportunities to be able to practice some of the skills we might want to teach him. So those are the sorts of things we might, we might come up with with Charlie's plan. And if we were to break that down, um, I'll concentrate on just one of those things for time. Um, but if we were going to break down what, what would my sexual, meeting my sexual needs met, met in a healthy way, what would that look like? Well, it might look like this. What, what do I know about sexual things? Learning about what's okay and what's not okay. Staying safe on the internet. Talking to girls and getting things right. And what's really important is when we're, when we're working with young people is that we're really open about what it is we're trying to do, what it is we're trying to change or build on. Um, we're not doing something to them. We want them to come along with us and understand why it is we're talking about consent. Why, why is that important? Um, also, why, why do we need to um, kind of make sense of some of these things? And how do we know when you're going to get better, when you're getting better at doing some of these things that people were worried about? How do we know when, that's, when, you, are, when you are making progress? But really, really obvious thing to say, they, they can't do it by themselves. Um, and us practitioners, we can't do it by ourselves. We need teams around these young people and children, and that's really important when we're talking about um, environments and situations. We, 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 it's not something you can do an hour, an hour a week in, in a room. This is very much about who is the team around this young person. And for Charlie, that might be mum and dad. It was a youth offending worker. It was the worker that was working with them in custody. And it was their personal officer in custody. But we might also want to include um, teachers, family support workers, those people that are... Um, in that young person's life on a regular basis. So they, those are the support teams, and those are the people that also need to understand what it is we're working towards and why we're doing it. So noticing change. Something that we, when we come to kind of um, write progress reports or talk to other professionals about um, how much change this young person has made or whether we think risk has been reduced, how, how do we do that? And, and, We've developed um, a very crude tool, it has to be said, it's, it, it's early days with that, but a, a, like a, a clinical ratings tool that practitioners can, can look at at the beginning when they start with a young person and, and score that young person of where we think they're at. And they do it jointly and collaboratively with the young person about what's our evidence for saying that we might be a bit worried about how you're dealing with feelings. Um, and then we might rate that midway through our intervention and then towards the end. So we're kind of looking for evidence to tell us that this young person is developing skills in this area and reducing the, the, the concerning behaviours um, around them. Um, we also might use psychometrics, but a young, I'm, I'm moving away from psychometrics personally. I feel I'm finding them, them more frustrating, um, really. And, and, and I think for, for young people... They might remember that they filled out a questionnaire, but, it, but, it, but it's um, in terms of they're not that interested, really, when you say, well, your score changed on that, um, what does that tell us? Actually, um, what they're more interested in and what they respond to is getting feedback from key important people. So hearing my mum and dad tell me, actually, when we talk to you now on the phone or when we see you, you're much calmer, that, that's really quite something important for that young person to hear. So getting feedback from the team... Um, in terms of noticing change and development is really key. 
Something that's also important um, that, we, that we do a lot in our practice is at transition time, so times when that young person might be preparing to leave custody, moving from one placement to another, is to really, really plan that and think about um, what that young person needs, knowing that any, any type of transition for any of us can be a stressful time and can mean, mean, mean we need more support. Um, so a young person, we're talking about going home, we're talking about what, what that plan might be very early on when we're working with them and we're talking about um, encouraging the use of support. But, but in terms of kind of um, what we might talk to a young person about is once you're out living at home and your worker came out to visit you, what sorts of things might they see that would tell us that things are going really well for you? And then we can have a look at what those things might be. And what sorts of things might tell us that things aren't, so, aren't going so well for you? And see if that young person can come up with the things that would um, tell us that, that things aren't so bad and more support is needed. And for Charlie, that might mean if we identified he was spending a lot more time at home on his own, um, in his bedroom and not mixing with his friends, that might be a concern for us that we'd want to do something about and understand. I think I'm out of time. Well done. <laughs> well done. Thank you very much. Okay. Have I got time for questions? Yes, I think so. Um, so, just has anybody uh, got any questions for Sarah before we close? I think I've got one question. There's no mention of Yeah, I think raising the issue of Yeah, it's crucial. It's crucial. Very don't crucial. Get that we, certainly within custody settings what we would try and use um, education staff that are involved with the young person but in the communities certainly we want to talk to teachers in fact I'm with the young person that I'm working with um, in the, later in the week I am actually meeting with the head teacher to talk talk about where we're at with with the progress so yes I agree it's with you embedded. I'm not it's yes not it's, embedded yeah. and we are very much the afterthought okay yeah we can learn from that yeah We spend a lot of time with parents, as, as much time as we can, and they need to be on board with us from the start. And, and generally what we find if we talk to them about the good lives model and, and them helping them understand why this behaviour has happened, they're more likely to come on board with us about some of the things they need to be doing. So it's about removing some of those external barriers, but that young person needs mum and dad to be around to talk to them. They need to be able to talk about sex at home. Um, yeah, so certainly we, we involve parents. In fact, I would say... We could work with parents a lot more than, than spending time with the child. Sometimes I might say, actually, I'm going to put all my efforts in with these mum and dad, and I want less time with the young person. That's what's needed. So it's always an individualised approach, but, but yeah, getting parents on board is hugely important. Can I say that that's one of the reasons why uh, <coughs> the approach, the way Sarah's working with us, on the focus on working with <coughs> parents, with carers, as well as young people, is very, very central approach and of course working with education in the community context is very much a part of that and, and absolutely key to success and this is why we feel it's so important uh, across the social work field that the focus is supporting parents, supporting families as well as children and young people, both have, not only the all. Thank you, thank you very much.